Serving up the champagne. Pop. It's my house. Come on. Turn it up. Uh. Hear a knock on the door and the night begins. Cause we've done this before, so you come on in. Make yourself at my home. Tell me where you been. Pour yourself something cold, baby. Cheers to this. Sometimes you gotta stay in. And you know where I live. Yeah, you know what we is. Sometimes you gotta stay in. in. Welcome to my house. Baby, take control. This is episode number 113 of Cowboy Shit with Ted and Wacey. I'm Ted. He is Wacey. We are freshly back from Florida. Got a little bit of sun, you know, a little bit of... Uh... I'm peeling. Yeah, me too. I... Where all are you peeling right now? I'm peeling on the back Just of my, my hands. My hands, my wrists, and like my Your wrists too? How yeah. about your legs? Your legs all right? Uh, not yet. Oh, they're fine. Yeah. They'll, but they that. won't be I fine mean... soon, right? What do you mean? Well, like if your hands and everything else is peeling, your legs will probably be peeling. Oh, hands. yeah. That's part of the process though. It's true. And we, yeah. uh, my ear lobes were peeling. My like neck was peeling. Cause you weren't wearing your stuff. fancy hat as much as you should. I should have probably wore it more, but you, yeah. uh, you, you got a little toasty out there. Wait, she was a little sunny for you. Yeah. It was a nice little sunburn. I usually get like one or two good sunburns a year and then I'm tanned up for the rest of the summer. So it's nice to get a head start on it. Um, it's a little, it's an early one. Hey, cause we're early like, one. We're, we're not going to mark. I mean, it is pretty warm this week, though. This is an abnormally warm part of March as far as my memory serves me, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I think it's, well, spring's officially sprung, so. I oh, well, think it, I not think till, we can ex- yeah, when does that happen? Tuesday? I think it was, this, I think it was like, just over this weekend. Spring begins, it the 20th, it's today. Yeah, yeah, so there you go. Well, how about is, that? Spring is officially sprung, so. How about it? It's nice that we're coming out of it. Today's kind of a windy, nasty day, but it's, yeah, it was it was, nice it was to, snow. it was nice to come home uh, and it not be minus 20 minus 30 because that I'm was your role last yeah. time yeah it was very nice so. to get out of town and have a warm one because it was like it was nasty cold the day before we left wasn't it uh it was cold enough it's like minus 10 minus 12 i think so it was yeah. around cold yeah. like, cold enough for you to notice a difference going from here to florida correct yeah but, so man florida i think that's the first the first thing here we uh uh what do we yeah because we recorded the last show right after the american so yeah so then, yeah. So on the 11th of March, we packed up, went to uh, Orlando and mm-hmm. landed in Orlando that night. Got some food at TJI Fridays. Mm-hmm. What else did we do? Then we, uh, <laughs> we didn't do much the first day. We kind of just traveled, got to where we needed to be. We went down to Disney Springs, like the shopping area, yeah, for Disney, that's right. which was that's really right. cool. I killed my feet in about three minutes. Yeah, that was a uh, poor choice of footwear on your end. It was, it sure. really was. I did not know what to expect with Disney Springs. I probably should have paid more attention, but little did we know, it turns out there was like a universal Springs right across the street from our hotel. We could have also went to, but didn't realize about that till the next day. But mm-hmm. anyways, we got to spend some time at Disney. Um, we, uh, what did we do? We actually, we actually didn't even get any food there. That was the plan was to go down. There We're trying to get food. So yeah. But it was so busy, but yeah, that was the one Friday thing I learned. Night. Not yeah, really you gotta honest. have reservations, man. People book like that kind of shit like so far in advance. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. That's it's impressive how how the force that people have with those trips. But I guess for a lot of families, it's like their one trip they do a year. So I yeah, or it. or less. Some people probably only go go there once in their lifetime. Yeah, for sure. Not, right? not many people decide they're going like us. Decide we're going the week before and <laughs> have to scramble to throw together a quick trip. <laughs> yeah, the uh, that was a fun. That was a cool day one. Yeah, day one Disney Springs was quite neat. Um, then we went to the next morning you got up. Uh, for those that voted in the poll, Wacey did not make his morning run. Now I'm a liar. Disney I'm a World. fraud. I'm a fraud. A fraud and a chode. Did not make. In my defense, in my defense, we stood up. We stayed up till like way too oh, late watching PM. Spider-Man. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was like midnight. That's true. No, it was like one. I think it was one, one, it was one, one o'clock, one thirty by the time we were actually okay. turned her off. It yeah. was a great movie. It was worth it. It's hard to it's one of those ones is hard to turn off if you if you have if you oh. near the end. And how right about off. how about American TV? How entertaining American It's TV good, but their commercial breaks are so long. Yeah, it's so is, exhausting, man. After being like, like a person who's been on streaming services for so long, <laughs> it's uh commercials suck. They're the Terrestrial worst. commercials are awful. <laughs> what the uh normal people watch or whoever I don't even know how many people have cable nowadays, but 
oh. it's miserable than the commercial side of things. I'm with you. The uh, it's good. Say? It's good stuff. Oh, did not make the uh, he did not make the run, but he did make a number of miles at Disney World. And- I put a 13 hour shift in at Disney, so I, there was some. I think it evens out in a sense. Well, that's what, and that's what I was trying to tell you before is you probably don't need to do a run because you're probably gonna get enough steps in on the on the old park. Yeah. There. But True. anyways, uh, got into Disney World. So tell us about the day, man. Just uh, give us the give us the rundown. What was it was awesome. It Disney was World like it was. Uh, I'm extremely satisfied with the trip. So I showed up there, kind of about 45 minutes before the gates opened, and I was in a line waiting for that. Like, good thing I showed up when I did it. Any later, and I'd have been waiting for a long time to get in. Um, so get in there, get in there, scan my ticket, and I head straight for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, which is in the, the Hollywood Studios theme park of Disney World. So I got there, and then I hadn't really planned to go on off on any rides off the bat, but then I jumped in the line for like the Rise of the Resistance, which is like the pop the popular Star Wars ride there. And um, freaking, I was in there in like the first half an hour I was on the park, so I got like, one ride deep as soon as I got there, and it was awesome. So I, I spent probably the first third of my day at galaxy's edge just trying to like cruise around and see what it was all about got a couple of rides at the millennium falcon ride tried to build a lightsaber but it was, that was a no-go zone for me because i guess again that's one of those things you have to book out like 30 days in advance so i had there's no chance i was getting it done that day so i'd end up buying buying a collectible item one from a current character rather than build my own so where was, uh where is it you're gonna show everybody uh, so on the video dad you want to see yeah go show us this lightsaber hey, so we also did another poll on what color of lightsaber weights he was gonna gonna make, and I believe the uh, I believe the this thing uh, was a pain in the ass to bring back on the airplane, but I'm happy I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was dark out so you can see. It's way it's way cooler when it's dark out. But yeah. Oh, it even makes it's noises. Cool. I'm pretty stoked about it. Yeah. All for the sweet. low. All for three easy payments of uh, fifty nine ninety five. Hey man, has real weight. It's good. It. Qual- good craftsmanship here. It's like metal. it's like the whole thing, like the hilt's like all metal. Really? Anyways, this is like me living my nerd dream. So I'm happy that I have this. But <laughs> it was worth the 45 minute wait in line to get it. Have you showed any uh ladies your lightsaber yet? <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> Man, it was hey, you uh, want to like, come back to my apartment to see my lightsaber? I don't want to jump for I want <laughs> I, I, I have like a yeah. No, I haven't had an opportunity yet. It's been a weird week. But oh yeah, what fine. happened? Oh, I just, I just, it's it just like, just weird. Like I, I never, I felt like I didn't feel great all week. Like today's the first day I felt normal since we got home. Like I just yeah. felt off all week. Jet lag. So. It's called jet lag. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to take like th- really this many days to get it's back a, to square. So somebody like a two hour difference, but yeah. Somebody told me it's a day per hour per hour. Damn. Every hour of difference that you have, it's about a day. So, so yeah. that about makes sense. Although it's when I mean, I didn't really, and I didn't really like, I was right back to the office as soon as I got back. Yeah, you did. You right that, that day would have sucked. Thursday would have sucked. Then you probably Thursday, would have went out for St. Patrick's Day. Well, Thursday, and it was a long day at work. Like I had, we had a bunch of events. So I was like running around taking photos all afternoon and like having to get like editing on the fly so I could get it up for the day and all that kind of stuff. It was it was a long day, but that's whatever. It is what it is. But anyways, yeah, I haven't shown anybody my lightsaber yet, but that was a cool thing. Um, and then I had the park hopper pass. So I kind of cruised around. I tried to go to the Star Wars Cantina. I couldn't go because, again, that's another thing people book out like 90 days. It's crazy. I tried so I tried six different times to get in there. Um, <laughs> but I drank a lot of – I drank – the one thing about Disney is you can walk around with booze. So I, would, I, I wasn't hard that to find was booze. Awesome. Oh, it was sweet, man. It was – I just – like that was like – there were like – overall, anyways, just to sum up the day, it was really cool. I got to go on some cool rides, see some really cool things, got up all my Star Wars like – out of my system that I need to get out, uh, but it's definitely want to go back and build a lightsaber, but it was a super cool day, but going there alone, man, was fucking awesome. I was a big fan of that. Cause I could just like, I literally had no agenda. Like I didn't have to worry about if anybody else wanted to do something or if anybody wanted to go on this or that, the other, I could just do what I wanted to do for the whole day and just whatever, whatever, whatever happened, happened. I kind of raw dog the day for lack of a better term. <laughs> and it was, it was awesome. It was a cool experience. I definitely will go be, would like to go back to Disney at some other point but i understand why people do more than one day just because well even for disney world there's like four different theme parks that cover 40 square miles so it's a big it's a lot of terrain there and you can spend a full day at each individual theme park um so anyways i i I tried to i maximized my experience for having only basically a a one day at disney i got got to see the magic kingdom and the the fireworks show um, I got some cool pictures. I haven't, we haven't posted, I haven't posted them yet. I was, uh, but I'll get them put up here soon, but they're, um, yeah, it was cool, man. It was a sweet day. 
And you guys had a cool day too, though. You went to Cape Canaveral to NASA and to yeah, we went to the studioing. Went to the uh, we went to the K- uh, Kennedy Space Center. So Kennedy Space Center, about an hour and a bit over at Cape Canaveral, where they launch all the rockets now. So like SpaceX is there, and so is so is uh, Blue Origin, uh, Jeff Bezos's company as well. So it's pretty. Jeff Bezos. Yeah, Bezos is yes. pretty cool to go and do that, and then uh, what else? Yeah, so saw all the rockets. I was I have to say that I was really proud. I was proud to be Canadian when, when we saw the. Uh, I think it was a space shuttle Atlantis Atlantis or Endeavor. I forget which one now I'd have to go back and look at some pictures, but the, one of the space shuttles there that made like 30 some trips to the, like around the, you know, 30, 30 trips to space hauling different things. And and so, you know, the Canada arm is on that space shuttle orbiter and, and they, they asked if any, is anybody here from Canada? Like, yeah, we are like, Oh, well, thank They said, thank you. It was like kind of neat. And I felt proud to be Canadian at that point where like, Canada was part of the space program. And like I had, nice. I just thought it was really cool to see something like that. It's like, it's know. a nice, it was a part, it's a cool moment because we haven't really been able to go and do much stuff lately. No. And to be like one of our first trips, like one of the, one of the first few bigger trips we've been on to somewhere else. And then yeah, a cool little moment like that's kind of neat. Eh? It was really cool. So yeah. I, yeah, I was proud to be Canadian. And then, I, and then I had to tell Storm, I was like, we, we better look up and see what, uh, if Canada's still involved in the space program, because if Trudeau is not putting us on any space stuff, it just kind of, it was, was going to make me feel sad about it, but I'm glad that, uh, <laughs> I'm glad that they're still, we're still spacing. Yeah. Glad that we're still involved in space a little bit, but, uh, okay. So I want to go back to some of these, uh, some of these polls. Oh God. Will he make the run? No. 82% of people said no, he would not make the run. And those people were right. Also, what else we got here? Is the run a good idea? No. <laughs> Is going to Disney World on Saturday during spring break a good idea? A lot of people said no, Wacy, but I think those people are those, wrong. Those people, the one, the wrong. one, the one thing that I think people don't You're right about the run, but wrong about going. Well, I think no, awesome. I think that well, I think the one thing that people like kind of like forget about or don't like consider. You're going to a theme park; it's going to be busy. Oh yeah, so it's, anyway, it's like. It's and anyway, you do it. So if you just go in there with the mentality, like it's going to be busy, there's going to be lineups, but no worries. I'm just here to hang out and have a good day. I think yeah. you can still have a good time. But I think a lot of people get confused that line and they're just like, oh, fuck, it's so busy. It's like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, but it's like you're yeah. there anyways. And that's, I think that's part of the reason why you got to go for a couple of days because the lineups are long and you're not going to get as much done as you might think you could. And if you miss a ride, then you could maybe go back the next day and get in that line first. Go well, even just doing the ride. individual theme parks, like I could have done yeah, the Hollywood you. Studios one just that day, and then the next day yeah. I could have done fully because I really only got a very small chunk of the Magic Kingdom experience. Like I just mm-hmm. got the fireworks and like did a little. Like I bought a sweater at the gift shop. Other than that, I didn't get, I didn't get to go on any rides, and there was so much more to explore there. So I think if you could just allocate one day per theme park, you can maximize yeah. your day that way. We'll work but, on that next time waste we'll go, maybe go to california oh it's it's far. whatever yeah it was i'm just thankful to be able to go it was so maybe, fun. we we did make a pact you me and storm that we that we might <laughs> may or may not go to disneyland in california for our 30th birthday parties i'll be 32 by the time we make 30th it, so. birthday slash um agm yeah yeah exactly <laughs> i wish it agm but think- okay so another poll how many rides does he make 59.1 percent of people said one to four and the other 40 Point nine said five to ten. How I went on five rides. You, on? you made five it on rides. five. Yeah. All right. So forty percent of people were correct on that one. What are the chances he eats too much cotton candy and gets a tummy ache? I eat zero people, cotton candy. A lot of people are saying yes. <laughs> I eat zero. I'm not a cotton candy guy. Okay, here's a good question though. What color of lightsaber is he going to build? Number one choice here, and the rest actually were tied. Number one choice. I can't see what color that is. It just looks clear. Well, and I'll tell you this. I'll tell you what it is after you. Okay, so I'm sorry. So first place was red and then tied for second three ways was blue, green, and purple. So red was the choice of the people. What color? Did you so get, I didn't go. So I got this one. I got the, it's called the dark saber. So it's actually black on the show. Oh, but it's okay. from the Mandal. It's from the Mandalorian. A black uh, lightsaber. That's neat. Yeah. It's pretty cool. If you watch the Mandalorian, you know what I'm talking about, but it's, uh, I went in. So for those that don't, I, for those that don't, black. it's just yeah, it's black. It's, it's, there's a whole story about 
I know that would take a whole podcast episode in itself to explain. If you yeah, we're not a Star Wars podcast. <laughs> we're not a Star Wars podcast. But anyways, so I, I, I wanted to build a lightsaber. And if had I built one, it would have been blue because that's the color that I like. Oh. So then my second option was to go to like the collectible store and buy like a lightsaber for one of the characters in the show. So I kind of had the two or three that I wanted to get. And the two that I really wanted to get were my first choice would have been like Anakin and Obi-Wan's, which were blue but they didn't have those as part of that collection. So the third place one was the dark saber, this one. Okay. So, but there was like a Darth Vader one that would have been red. That would have been cool. But I don't know. Just the two that I, the two, the two that I really wanted weren't there. So <laughs> I got the, my third place one. Which was oh, fine. oh, this is a good question. How many Karens get offended by his new cowboy shit hat and his fancy new shoes? How many people said anything about your shoes or did anyone? Ah, uh, nobody, no, nobody. No did. shoe comments. Any hat comments? Nothing. No, nothing. Oh, really? Okay. Kind of right. I, I I like I had a couple people like I was BSing in the line just asking like what it's about, but other than that, nobody. There were way more adults there than I expected. Man, you know what? You, I'm gonna it was like the our our age of people were there most. Yeah, you know what? Disney is yeah. adult slaps. So don't if you have kids or if you don't have kids and you're hesitating going to Disney, just go. It's a fucking blast. Yeah, just, they just walk around, and you know, and like beers. It was like eight bucks for a beer. Like it's really it's not that bad. Yeah, it's just um, like going to a hockey game. It's, it's, it's yeah, like going it's to a big hockey game. But it's like, yeah, it was one of those things where, I mean, it was so fun. I just had a nice little, maintained a nice little buzz throughout the whole day and just yeah. cruised around Disney. So, yeah, I like, I, after that, I, I kind of want to go again. And I want to go, I think we got to go to California though. It's a little, a little closer. So, so we'll, yeah, uh, so. we'll make another Disney tour in a while. But, anyways, from there, got done at Disney. Uh, Storm and I went to a Universal Studios. We, we got done at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. And then we skipped over. We got done there at like cup like two o'clock kind of thing. So then we we're like, well, we got all afternoon. So we went over to Universal. We saw, uh, we saw the Harry Potter stuff there. It was pretty pretty neat. Uh, drank some Duff beer. Yeah, drank some Duff beer in the Simpsons land. And you guys would hit like what a handful of rides as well, hey? Yeah, we we hit a few as well. We probably hit five. Mm-hmm. We we hit a few. It was uh, it was entertaining, and no like really really roller coasters, but it was still uh, it was still still awesome time. We had a good good trip. So. You know, just something different and exciting and just kick loose a little bit. We haven't done a lot of that in quite a while. So much, well, that man. was next morning. Woke up and went to. Should we save the hat, the no. second part for the second half? Well, we could. So we'll go to our coming up is here. part two of our yeah. Florida trip. So, yeah, part two of the Florida trip uh, presented by our friends at Wrangler. Uh, we'll uh, we'll catch up with that right after the after our interview this week with uh, with PBR's Chad Blankenship talking PBR teams. So. Hope you all enjoy this uh, interview and we'll tell you more about Florida after that. All right. Welcome back. This is Cowboy Shit with Ted and Wacy. I'm Ted. He's Wacy, and we are with this week's guest. He is the senior vice. He is a senior vice president at the PBR, leading the team's league development. Please welcome to the show, Chad Blankenship. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, guys. My pleasure. Good to see you both. We. Uh, it's been a while. I don't know when we would have caught up last, Chad. It was probably a uh, World Finals or uh, something somewhere i kind of forget now but it's been it's been a little bit now it it has been not as much cross-border travel although thank goodness it's finally picking up finally back finally back well i think uh we'll get right into this thing we're gonna what we're gonna do is we want to a big part of this show is going to be pbr teams but one thing that caught our eye when when wacy and i were doing our pre-show research was some of the stuff you've done on your way to the pbr so wacy why don't you kick it off 
Well, as we talk, were talking off camera there, you had specific Ted said ESPN. You've worked with some really cool projects outside of the Western world. So talk a bit about that journey and how you ultimately ended up with PBR. Yeah, I mean, I started my career when I got out of college uh, in, in advertising and marketing. I had a lot of fun there, creating some really good, compelling ads. Um, and one of the things that was most rewarding about the job was just being able to work in a space where the 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 trade craft is all about folks um, emotional uh, draw you know to the to the brand or whatever I was working on um, <clears throat> I, and just as a marketer when that when that natural energy exists people don't generally get that excited about their soap um, but they get super <laughs> excited about sports and entertainment uh, and so I learned that pretty early in my career. Uh, as a marketer and and learned that I got a lot of juice kind of in that area. So um, when I transitioned out of advertising, the first job I had, I, I moved to New York City. Um, I grew up in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, which is, as some of your listeners and viewers will know, is Southeast Tulsa uh, in the heart of cowboy country, although I won't, I won't suggest that I really, really grew up cowboy in the traditional sense. Um, so I, I lived in Dallas and Portland, Oregon and Los Angeles and lived in Asia for a year and, and traveled around uh, a little bit of a life study abroad. And then when I came back, uh, I really pursued a career in sports. And so my first job moving to New York City was New York was bidding for the 2012 Olympic Games. Uh, and I worked on that for a couple of years, trying to drum up support uh, around New York and the business community um, to get folks excited about the Olympic Games. Obviously, that Games was ultimately awarded to London and they put on a terrific show. Uh, but it was a really fun way into sport uh, and had me thinking a lot about kind of the purpose of sport, you know, beyond entertainment. And I think this ties back to cowboy values. You know, one of the amazing things about sport is witnessing athletes of, of, at all levels uh, achieving their goals and achieving more. And maybe that's breaking the four minute, you know, mile barrier. Um, but it's also, I think just everyday athletes, you know, we can relate whether we're, whether we're, running around the rodeo arena or, you know, a marathon course or whatever it is. And so I, I find that aspect of sports, the human achievement aspect of sports to be really inspiring. Uh, and the Olympic movement is, is at least purportedly rooted in that. <laughs> so um, that was a thrill. And then I went from NYC 2012, as it was called, uh, to ESPN and had a really long and very rewarding run there uh, of about seven and a half years. We could talk about that more. Um, worked in a in a pretty broad array, wide array of uh, different marketing capacities there on everything from motorsports with NASCAR and NHRA uh, and IndyCar to college sports, college football, college basketball. Uh, and then I worked on a pretty key Disney initiative down in, in Orlando related to what is now called the, the ESPN wide world of sports. Um, one thing that, so I creeped your LinkedIn as most, uh, professionals do these days and one thing that really stood out to me was you have your master's in spiritual psychology and one thing mm -hmm. that that i think a lot of people miss if you're if you're not involved in marketing directly is like how much psychology plays into the marketing field how uh how, so what led you to take that as your master's and how has that helped you along your journey to where you are now yeah great question an unexpected one too um, so the, the master's in spiritual psychology was, was as much about personal discovery to be quite candid as it was, uh, about what I anticipated the professional yield would be. Although, um, although with the curriculum, I will say that it, it did, um, it did give me a stronger skill set to, to look a little more inward with myself. Um, but also in, I think, developing greater empathy and working with other people. So mm -hmm. it's definitely yielded uh, some unexpected and really rewarding kind of kind of consequence uh, in terms of leadership and management and certainly working with consumers and brands. But I think, you know, we see one of the keys from my point of view, one of the keys with marketing and being good at it is an ability to immerse oneself in the target audience and really understand, you know, what is their psychology and relationship with the product, the service, the sport, you know, the entertainment vehicle, uh, and then using that insight to kind of further their emotional connection to whatever it is that we're trying to market or sell. Uh, and then ideally even improve the, 
the product or the service or the experience to the benefit of the consumer. Um, that, that I feel like is when it works really well. So that, that leads into the next question quite well, I think. So going back to your time in the advertising business, a couple of brands that stand out, Activision, LA Times, uh, you had uh, Continental Airlines at the time, which is now United, Home Depot, Wyndham Hotels, Coca-Cola, Diet Coke. Like, I gotta, We got to talk about some of that stuff and some of the most memorable ads you might have been a part of uh, that you can maybe share with us. Yeah. Um, um, one of the most fun things that I worked on was um, while I was at an agency in, um, in uh, Portland, Oregon called Widening Kennedy. Um, and I was working on Coca-Cola and Diet Coke, and we were, we were creating a completely new campaign for Diet Coke. The consumer insight there was that, was that for serious Diet Coke drinkers, they don't really think about it as a diet beverage. They made a decision somewhere along the way that they wanted to cut out sugar and you know have, have a one calorie or zero calorie soda. But when you do consumer research with that audience, they don't call it Diet Coke. They call it Coke. They say, I'm going to go have a Coke. Theirs is in a white and silver can instead of a red and white can. But for them, it's still Coke. And so rooted in that consumer insight, we went off and um, shot some TV commercials. And the fun part of this was that you guys will remember Kevin Smith as the director of, of Clerks and Jay and Silent really created Jay and Silent Bob, not just the director, um, Dogma, Chasing Amy, a whole bunch of other films. Uh, and so he wanted to do some TV commercials at the time, and we we brought him in to direct. Uh, and we're shooting one of the scenes at the Central Park Zoo. And at the time, Kevin was um, was pretty uh, tight with Ben Affleck, and so Ben Affleck pop, pops by the set. And at that point, I think I think when we were shooting this, it was probably just after um, Goodwill Hunting. And so we're we're shooting. Uh, and Ben comes by and he'd mentioned that Ben was going to come by, which was pretty cool. Um, so met Ben and whatever. And then at one point, you know, half an hour goes by and we resume shooting and I sort of glance over. Um, and I just, my eye is caught by this amazingly beautiful, like natural, just completely beautiful woman. Um, and did a double take. I was like, Oh my God, that like that woman is so beautiful. And then look away, you know, so I'm not rude. And then I do a triple take and I realize, Holy ben crap. Then. Gwyneth Paltrow is on our set right now. No way. Because Holy. this is when Gwen and Ben, I mean, I'm going back. This is late 90s, but Gwyneth Paltrow and, and Ben Affleck are uh, are an item at the time. And there she is, you know, no makeup, hair pulled back, trench coat, wearing Chuck Taylors. Just like, wow, this is why movie stars are movie stars because they don't they don't just translate <laughs> under good lighting. They Dang. also translate under amazing natural lighting. Um, so you know, that's a little bit of a sort of a fun uh, celebrity outcome of a TV commercial shoot that was completely unexpected. Oh, um, it's, it's, so the, it's fun. The next experience I want to talk about is one, uh, I got, we, one more thing on on the marketing okay. side. What was I, well, the, that's, that's, what was the yeah, worst anyway. fail on oh, on the, those, That's a good one. Yeah. Nice. There had to be a bust oh somewhere along the way. And what? And there's got, there had to been one where you, co- you were confident that it was going to hit. And then it just, cause I've had this happen, even like with the TikTok videos that I make, like I'll put so much time and thought and effort into it. I'm like, yeah, this can be a banger million views coming up and it gets like less than 5,000. I'm just like, Fuck. and now okay. I, post one I got it. it. Yeah. I got a good one for you. And it, and it's a, it's a personal fail in the context of marketing, not just, it's not one that I'm going to ascribe to, to anybody else. So I'm in ESPN. <clears throat> I've been there about six months uh, and ESPN uh, gets back the rights to NASCAR. It, it, ESPN and NASCAR were like thick as thieves uh, in the early days, and then NASCAR decided to to take its rights somewhere else and went to it, to NBC, um, and got a lot of broadcast coverage, and it really helped elevate the sport even more. And 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 Dale Senior died, which also contributed to a lot of fans, you know, kind of coming back and rediscovering their love for NASCAR. And then, um, but but what NASCAR was missing out on. Um, during that time frame that it had gone away from ESPN for seven or eight years is that it wasn't part of the day-to-day conversation on the sports center. ESPN didn't have any rights to show any of the racing. And, and, and in this era that I'm describing, we weren't all getting our news from our phones every morning. 
we people you know sports center was the way that a sports fan woke up in the us and canada frankly during that time frame and so when the announcement went out that espn uh was was once again going to have the rights to nascar i went to my boss again i was pretty green there still only been there about six months and i said listen if there was any opportunity for me to work on this thing i would absolutely love 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 to work on nascar i i know that i would just crush it it's a sport that has so much passion etc lo and behold he calls me you know 30 days later and says hey remember that conversation we had you know you got it we're giving it to you i'm like holy crap it's amazing so we do this launch campaign for nascar and adds all these components and we're flying all over the country and we're shooting in charlotte and we're shooting in I think we went down to Homestead outside of Miami, the, the track down there. We went out to Fontana, the track in California, and we're just shooting all these different components to the advertising campaign. Okay. I'm out, I'm out in California. And at this point, um, it's it's maybe a year. This was the second phase of the campaign. So it's a year. And at this point, I met a bunch of drivers. I've spent, I've probably been to 15 NASCAR races. Like I understand it. I've spent tons of times with time with the athletes, et cetera. And so we're doing, we're doing the second season NASCAR campaign and I'm out in California at the Fontana Raceway. And the principal character is, is, is a very Wacy Anderson style, good old boy that we've cast. Who's a key fan. The scene that we're shooting, he's standing on top of an RV, which is very common practice at a NASCAR race. <laughs> and the cars are zooming around and around and around. Right. And so wardrobe, um has has wardrobe for our principal character and if you invest envision Wacy, you've got the right guy and <laughs> we want him to wear shorts and for some reason the wardrobe stylist has the selection of shorts none of which are perfect and she's got these corduroy ocean pacific shorts that are just like a little bit too short they're coming off on a, on our guy as like short shorts and i comment that like th you know this isn't going to work uh, and unfortunately, they, there are literally no other shorts in our principal cast's size. And I call my boss on the phone and I'm like, it's making me a little bit comfortable, but the, uncomfortable because I don't feel like this guy is, is really, you know, this is not supposed to be an ironic commercial um, with his short, short corduroy shorts on. And the agency, the advertising agency who we've hired is like all over me to approve it because of the creative people think it's great. And so I call my boss for some advice. And he basically says, the decision is on you, Chad. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, don't have, don't get Stockholm syndrome though, with the agency pressuring you too hard. If you think that it's not right, put the guy in jeans, which, which is, was great advice and should have been easy advice. And as, as the next half hour transpires, um, I, eventually I allow the agency to convince me that the shorts are going to be okay. Oh, no. And so we shoot the whole campaign. There's no time to go out and buy other shorts, by the way. And the Fontana is in the middle of, it's not really in the middle of nowhere, but it may as well be. So there's no time to go buy more clothes. You know, we got to start rolling, ca rolling camera. And so we shoot the commercial and there's plenty of shots of the guy, you know, waist up where you can't see his shorts, but there's the establishing shot where the camera's a little wide and you're seeing the cars go around the track and we've got our guy in his shorts <laughs> and, uh, and you can tell where we're going here. I made the wrong decision. The only negative feedback that that my boss and the other folks back uh, in Bristol had about this commercial when they saw it was that the guy had on too short of shorts in the establishing shot. So um, I think the point of of that too long story is just when you have an instinct around something like that and you're kind of creating art when it doesn't feel right, trust your instincts that it's not right and make a different decision before you spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a TV commercial. That feels tone deaf because the guy's shorts are too short. Oh man! And did it, and it, and it hit it hit it hit the hit the networks and stuff? Like it, it went yeah, on. it did because we didn't have another choice. Uh, was it well received? We didn't have another then choice or? for the shot. So, yeah, I feel like I've got to dig that up at this point and send it That's to you guys. That's funny. So it was... wasn't a federal offense, but it just felt tone deaf. And you don't want you know the thing about sports, especially this is true of so many things in life. But as a marketer. One of the other key rules of sports is that authenticity is so incredibly important. I mean, you guys know it. This happens a lot of times when a brand comes in and tries to co-op the cowboy world, right? There are some, there are just some truths and there's some subtleties about the cowboy way of life for cowboys and cowgirls. And when somebody from the outside comes in and tries to do, you know, storytelling or narrative, like in, in our space, 
you can quickly tell when the authenticity is just not there. Yeah. You know, and you know what? You, you like with the Yellowstone craze and everything, you see a little bit of that. You know, like Taylor Sheridan's a cowboy guy, and like for the most part, he's pretty accurate, but you can see where they've <laughs> added in some of the Hollywood elements or they've missed the mark. Like, I remember for the couple scenes from the first season where they're branding in the rain, they're pulling a calf in the middle of a field where it's like anybody who has any type of farming or ranching background can pick that out. Cause like we ne- like never would have do that growing up. Like you can't, you can't brand right. the rain. You're, if you try to pull a calf in the middle of a field, the cow's going to kill you. <laughs> it's like yep. stuff like, and there was even a, when they did the first 1883 cut scene, in the second season or fourth season four or season three of Yellowstone, the cows still had tags in their ears. Right. How to cow would a cow have a tag in its ear in 1883? Just like little things like that, where it's, you know what I mean, though, where it's like they're yep. on the right track and they got it, but it's just like these few things is the real people are going to pull it out. Or who ha- are the scene lady, the, the Mexican fighting bull in the dark? Like who has a Mexican fighting bull that's kicking around their ranch? Like I know zero people. Right. <laughs> that grew up around that has right that has a, that has a fighting unless race. you're raising mexican unless fighting you're raising bulls, but, then, but then you don't have a bunch of cows <laughs> milk cows and beef cows running around yeah so just like stuff like that where it's like i mean to the to the average person they wouldn't be able to point that out but for people from our walks of life it's it's easy to to pinpoint that kind of thing it's a it's a interesting thing it's a great it's a great example yep okay nice. so espn where else do you want to go on that ways yeah i I mean, yeah, we can move into the team stuff. I could, like, we could be here for two hours. So yeah. I'll just, this, and you know, the sets, this, we just need to have a bullshit one of these days, anyways. I've just like to hear all these stories. Well, oh, let's yeah. have a couple pints. Yeah, a couple yeah. Of pints. <laughs> so, couple of pints. So we're actually, <laughs> we're actually working on coming to Cheyenne for the first one. We actually have the dates where we can, we might be able to make work be in Cheyenne. So, okay. So team starts in Cheyenne. We can say that the 25th and 26th of July, right? Is that the first, first event as PBR teams? Is that right? That's that is correct. It's like you've hosted a podcast before. Your segue there was so smooth. I just have to acknowledge that. <laughs> we've, um, is, we've done 113 of these suckers. Now. We're, we're still not good, but but Cheyenne. So this has been a concept that's been in the works for, I guess, first off, how long and and what did it take to get to be here? Like, and, there's and there's why? so many ways to go. Yeah, why? Yeah, and why? Let's, yeah, let's I mean, we, we 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 would say a decade plus. Our commissioner. Sean Gleason would say easily a decade plus. Um, a decade ago, there was a, a previous uh, Global Cup concept that yeah. was called the World Cup, you know, at mm-hmm. the time. Um, like 06, and, 7, 8 kind of thing, wasn't it? Yeah, and it that's went right. Mexico, Brazil, and the States. Like and we actually States, had that's right. World Cup in Bajetos, which was unbelievable. I was watching parts of it. And the Mexican yeah. one sounded wild too. Remember Richard Jones it telling did. about that one? It looked nuts. They said it, they said it was wild. Um, I think that was the first time that PBR had experimented with a team format um, and that the economics of it weren't, I, I think was the main issue, weren't totally like bearing out the way that they wanted to. But Sean had always had it in his mind um, that there was something there with teams. And so obviously three, four or five years ago, we revived um, the revived the nation versus nation team concept. Um, we started in Edmonton. Uh, as you guys know, we went to Sydney, and I think we've now done three of them at Cowboys Stadium uh, here. And frankly, would have done more if if not for the for the you know for COVID um, <clears throat> and international travel. But what I, what I feel like I've seen in the six years that I've been here, and you guys will have your own points of view too because you've been around for a long time. But you know what I've heard from the riders, and certainly what I think I've seen with my own eyes with these team format events, is that the guys ride to the occasion. And they ride at a higher level. They they talk about riding for a purpose that's bigger than they are. And I think the teams that have been better coached, the the athletes definitely feel that. I mean, if for for those of, of your listeners who watched the Global Cup last weekend, you know, candidly, I, I think on paper the Brazil team looked strongest coming in, um, and the Eagles coach Ross Coleman could have made some different decisions about other guys that you know he might have brought in to the Eagles squad, (laughs) but, um, (laughs) but, but what he managed to do, and I think this is a lot, it's a credit to the riders for sure. They ride the bulls, but it's also a credit to Ross Coleman as coach and what he saw in these guys as bringing them together. I think that team was coached to a first place finish rather than a second place finish. And it speaks to, um, it speaks to the potential, you know, of the team format. Um, we also, during the COVID shutdown, you know, you guys know we did the Monster Energy Team Challenge. Um, that was a bit of a, 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 you know, a bit of a um, sort of creative approach to to feeling the need to set Unleash the Beast and the 
world points race aside, we didn't, none of us knew obviously at that point how long COVID was going to last. And so we're trying to create continued earning opportunities for the bull riders and the stock contractors. And we said, Hey, let's try, you know, the team concept again, but all, all, all of those things. And then of course we've had Cowboys for a cause We've done a couple of times on the USS Lexington down in Corpus Christi. We're going to do another one in uh, this May in Tampa, Florida. And from all of these things, we've just been learning and tweaking a little bit on uh, how do we put a format, you know, together that can really work. Uh, and I, and I think, I think we found it. It'll, it'll be, I'll have a stronger point of view about that um, on November 6th next year after we <laughs> completed a full season. Um, but we have pushed and pulled against uh, the format internally over the last six months, a, a lot. Um, and we've gotten feedback from the riders, from the team owners that we have assembled now. And I, I'd love to speak more about them, you know, from the coaches that have come in and, and signed up uh, uh, with the teams. I'm happy to talk about, th about that uh, group of legends as well. Um, but I'm, I'm so bullish on this, on this concept and, and, and what can happen our sport, you know, some of our riders work with trainers on a, on a relatively regular basis. Some of them go to bull riding schools and they continue to get, you know, what I would characterize as coaching from their mentors, whether that's, you know, Cody Lambert or Jerome Davis or, jw hart or you know any number of other legendary bull riders some of whom are obviously amongst our coaching ranks now but none of the guys are really consistently working you know season in and season out um, with coaching and training staff that are all united around them as a team and i think that's that there's a lot of untapped potential there um with riders having the benefit of that kind of coaching I, you know the other the other thing that teams is really about for us is kind of like what i spoke to with the monster Energy team challenge last year we're we're always looking for continued opportunities to put more money in the pockets of our bull riders and i think that the pbr team series presents a huge opportunity for our guys to earn more um on the guaranteed money front and also you know on the bigger level on the prize front um as they have success uh, together as a team. So I'm really, I know I, I talked a lot and there are 14 questions we can talk about, but it's just, uh, I'm, I'm super excited about it. I think it's the most exciting thing that's happened in bull riding since the founding of the PBR. I, I really, really, I genuinely do. And I think everyone's going to be saying that in November. It's the most major change in format and the PBR already had a format, a better, a, a better and more defined format than any other Western sport, in my opinion. I, I know Flint and I talked about this probably like six, seven, eight years ago. And it was kind of something that like clicked when he was on his show. And I said, P the PBR and, and most bull riding events have an actual format that's consistent everywhere you go. We have, we have a, a first round and a, and a long round or and a short round. And you have a winner each night. No matter where you're going to a bull riding, you're going to have a winner. Or you can go to rodeo and you might have a winner. You might not. You might have this. You might have that. You just never know. You're not going to see the best. But it's hard to with, be a casual fan of rodeo. Yeah. We're with the PBR. You can it is. You get a winner every night. So with the, but, but like I said, it's, this, and like you said, this is the biggest change. This is the biggest change ever in the PBR to having it, to have a shortened world title race, which is the first, the individual competition. And now have another whole yep. season where a guy like Jose Vitor Leme, if he just wants to be riding the world title race, he doesn't have to go to teams. It's going to be somebody you're going to miss having, but he technically does not have to go on the team side. He could have an actual right. off season for the first time ever. That's right. Well, I, I, um, yeah, I, I mean, yes, because of the timing, I, I think that is an accurate way to say it because the off season has really for the guys been, you know, five weeks yeah. in that transition between mid November and January. However, there's also been a summer, there's been an optional summer, call it a recovery period. And, 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 uh, you know, many of the guys, some of the guys, some of the Brazilians go to Brazil they go home and visit their family in the winter time, right. Which is our summer. Um, but a lot of guys choose to continue to ride all the way throughout the summer. And so I think one of the, one of the great things that's going to be happening now for PBR is that we haven't, we're going to have continuity in the individual season in the Unleash the Beast and the Velocity Tour. Um, we're in a transition year right now, this current season, which is shortened. It has five fewer Unleash the Beast events than normal, starting with the 2023 season you know, we'll be back to, to a couple of dozen Unleash the Beast events. The 2023 Unleash the Beast season is going to start uh, in mid to late November. And so we'll, we're going to continue to sort of shift the schedule around a little bit. Ultimately, 
the individual season is going to run from November to May. And the team season is going to run from June to uh, to October. So that won't be the case in this calendar year, but starting next year, that's how it'll work. And and Ted, you said it, you know, riders are going to have, they're actually going to have an option to, to choose. Do they want to be competing the individual season or in the team season or both? And I, I could see, I could see some guys wanting to enter just through the team season, wanting to enter PBR just through the team season. I could also see some guys, you know, who might be in the later part of their career who don't want to have to have the durability of 25 individual events who will individual season events who will just come and ride in teams. You know, you guys, I'll let you guys name the names, but, um, but I, but I think there's some guys that could come and really have success. One of the other exciting things about a little tangent here, but about um, the, the team bull riding format is, is very similar to the global cup. We're going to draw the bulls to the teams, not to the riders. And so the riders and the coaches are going to work together to see who matches up better. We have seen that in the global cup format, if you look at an individual guy's performance across multiple global cup events, their riding percentage increases. I think that's for, due to a couple of factors. One, I think it's because they're generally matching up with bulls that they might match up better with. Um, Two, I think it's because they're riding for something bigger than themselves because they belong to a team. And three, I think it's because of the motivation that can come with coaching. Um, and, and we're absolutely going to see that in the PBR teams well, series. I, do you think that the guys are going to ride as much for their team that they're on with teams as they do for their country? I don't know. That's, a, that's an interesting question. I've asked, I've asked it of myself. Um, there's more money to be won together as teammates in teams. I mean, partly because it's just, it's 11 events as opposed to, you know, one weekend. Um, so I, while I don't, while I don't think out of the gate, uh, being able to, the coach's ability to tap into national pride, I think for the riders and the riders just own natural proclivity to do that, uh, has certainly made an impact, you know, in Edmonton, watching the Canadians gut it out because they were in front of their hometown crowd. And the same thing happened in Australia, you know, with the Australians where it was down to the wire and they almost won, you know, they, I mean, they lost on the last bull, stinking bull ride. Um, <laughs> super exciting. And they feel the energy of the crowd, but I think that energy of the crowd can also really come into play in the PBR team series because we're going to have hometown crowds. Now it's going to take a couple of years, I think, to really develop, you know, the, the, the outlaws in Kansas city, and they are so pro their team. We obviously, we're going to have one home team per one home team event per season, as opposed to, you know, a home stand of 11 football games or 15 football games or whatever. Um, but, but I do think I can tell you that the team owners are really invested in building that fan base that will, so then there'll be a huge supporter section. You know, we're talking a lot uh, about major league soccer as a reference point. And there's a lot of clubs out there that are doing it well. And I'm, I mean, all the way to parades with flags where the fans, you know, go from one place and walk a couple of blocks, you know, and come in, I, those things are going to happen in PBR teams. I think they'd be a little weird and unleash the beast. Um, but, but they're going to work, you know, in, in PBR teams. And I think, um, the merchandise is going to be really fun, you know, kids and adults ability to wear, um, the Jersey for their favorite team. We see that at the global cup again, part of that, you know, like you said, Ted is, is national pride. Um, but I think we're going to have some hometown and regional pride too, or somebody's a fan of, you know, I'm a huge fan of chase outlaw. And even though he's not on the Missouri thunder team, which is close to Northwest Arkansas, you know, they're not, they're now an Arizona Ridge riders fan, um, because they love chase and he's been drafted by the Ridge riders. It's like when you have an Oilers fan in Calgary, because it's Stanley exactly. David. Well, and, to, and, and an example. Well, and, and I mean, there's like, because you're not guaranteed a roster spot as a rider on a team. So if you're if you're not competing and you're not living up to your potential or competing at a certain level, like you could lose your roster spot too. So I mean, there's there are ways to create urgency and bring that high level product to these events. If you're there's something on the line for these guys, you know what I mean? Like that's why you see the, the, the your mid to lower six or like your lower end players in the NHL. Like they're busting their ass every night because they're not guaranteed they're going to be around the next game, right? If they're not pl bringing their playing their ass off every game, they're going to be shipped shipped back to NHL, be making fifty grand a year as opposed to seven hundred fifty or five hundred thousand in NHL. That's right. And the way we've structured it, <clears throat> going into each event weekend, teams are designating their starters and and an alternate for the regular season events. Teams are generally going to bring six riders. 
all the games are a five five versus five matchup. So you'll, uh, you know, you essentially have those five starters that you would assume are going to compete in all three games um, over the weekend. However, teams have the flexibility to bring that alternate in, you know, off the proverbial bench in air quotes. Uh, and, uh, and, and he can participate in a game too. And so the, the pay that the riders are going to going to earn, um, they're all going to earn appearance fees, AKA show up money. Um, but that's somewhat based on their designation as a starter or an alternate in year one. It's also based on, uh, based somewhat on draft position. Um, but yeah, that, that, I'll use the word relegation, Wacy, to, to kind of characterize what you're speaking to. There, there's a week in and week out, you know, um, relegation situation cut, for yeah. for the individual riders. Yeah, you can get cut too. Um, so th- there's a lot of motivation, I think, for the riders to to be successful each weekend. I, one of the other things that's different in this format from a from a prize pool. So in really simple terms, riders are going to be compensated by guaranteed appearance fees. And riders are going to be compensated by the prize pool. There are other there are other mechanics at play too. They can have multi year marketing agreements with their teams. So there's other ways to make money. But to just keep it simple, they're they're those two buckets of money for the riders. On the on the prize pool front, um, sort of atypical for bull riding, all every weekend and every event, there's an event winner and there's an event prize pool, as there usually is. But it pays eight places deep. Um, which is to say every weekend, which is to say that every team and every rider who is competing on the team is going to take take uh, leave with something in terms of a prize pool. And we we had a lot of discussion around this. Obviously, the winning team riders are going to make more, going to leave with a bigger check than the eighth place riders. But we had a lot of conversation about that internally, you know, philosophically. It's going to happen where there are going to be some teams that might not ride a single bull all weekend. Certainly, there'll be riders who don't cover a bull all weekend, but they're still going to get some prize money, you know. And we had a lot of discussion around philosophically: is that the right setup for a sport that, you know, where its athletes typically eat what they kill? You know, um, maybe the wrong metaphor for bull riding, but you understand <laughs> the point. Um, yeah, but, but, you but we think, eat. yeah, but we think it's the we think it's just the right thing to do. Um, for the riders to motivate them to have success each weekend. And then at the end of the 10 event regular season, um, there's a substantial, what we call regular season bonus. That's going to pay to the riders also eight places deep um, should keep them motivated to have success, you know, and work hard every weekend because it's a substantial pot of money that will, that will pay eight deep. And of course the first, second, third place teams in the regular season in the regular season rankings will earn the most each of those riders. Uh, and then, uh, and then in the playoff, because we're starting with eight teams, the championship event, the first two teams are the, the highest place. Two teams are going to get a buy going into the first night of the championship event. Uh, and so the other six teams will all ride. And then it, it's essentially a double elimination format throughout the rest of the championship weekend. And then that's the one event where the payout is not going to go eight places deep. It'll just go four places deep. So those first four teams that get eliminated in the championship format will, will not, they have the opportunity to win some game money along the way, but they won't be part of the big prize payout. So, so basically your format in the last like Sunday, Sunday in Vegas, or is it Saturday? When do you finish? I forget. Uh, It's going to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a three day event in Vegas. So Sunday you, and uh, five by five, for three games a night means you're well, three games a weekend, you're still going to have essentially 40 bull rides per night. Is that, is my math right? Cause there's no short round. So it's 30 and 10. So you're still having 40 outs per night of competition, correct? Um, we, there's a slight adjustment to the format in the championship event where there's basically a last chance game that yeah. is a three-way game. So okay. that specific game has 15 bull rides cause it's five V five V five. Yeah. But, but you're, um, are we still 40 rides a night essentially? Or what is, what is the math on that? Is, yeah. Is math right we're, for, we're, we're, for the Sunday, I didn't answer your question well, because for That's the Sunday, okay. you're correct. There are going to be 40 bull rides. So there'll be, you know, the, the first, the first seed versus the fourth, the second versus the third. Yeah. And then, you know, the losers will play each other in the consolation game to determine who finishes the season third and fourth yeah. and the, and the games at the end championship game at the end. So that, that format will be 40 bull rides. Cause on the Sunday, it'll all be five versus five matchups. And it'll be two, like the, they're going to have to get on two bulls on Sunday, each team. Correct. Correct. Yeah. 
Where so like a normal night in Cheyenne is going to be twenty bull rides. Is that right? It's a little bit less. No, than so every so every team plays. Um, so of the ten regular season events, two of them are two day events. Yeah. Cheyenne and Anaheim, they're the neutral site events. Basically, we call them neutral site because there's not a home team in that market. And then the other eight, which are all home team markets, they'll all have three day events. So here's the here's the event format. So on let's just say for simplicity, it's a it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. And in the case of Cheyenne, Monday, Tuesday are the same as Friday, Saturday. So um, Friday night, there's going to be 40 bull rides. There are eight teams. Each team will match up against another team in a five versus five matchup. The whole game will be structured to play out. So Team Ted versus Team Wasey is going to be the first, we could call it section of the night with a five yeah. versus five matchup. And we have resolution and, you know, and Wasey wins. Yeah. And then tomorrow night, it's Ted versus Chad and Wasey versus Michael Gaffney and, you know, so on. So it's yeah, sort of a round robin tournament, tournament format. And so what we're really tracking here is game wins. Yeah. So on Sunday, at the end of three rounds in a, in a three, three day event format, um, we're going to probably have one or maybe two teams that are three and oh, mm-hmm. we're going to have a bunch of teams that are two and one or one and two. And maybe there's a couple teams that are oh and three. And um, second, so second, a lot of ties. Is- is uh, aggregate uh, score is how you declare your event winner for the weekend. If there's two teams, three and zero, it'll default to aggregate no. score on rides. No, no. Here's okay. where it's fun. He's explaining. So it. I'm listening. So I'm listening. on the last day of competition, whether it's a two day format or three day, there's going to be a bonus round. Oh. One bonus round. One rider from each team. So can think about it as kind of an eight bull short go. Yeah. Um, in the bonus round. We're going to rank all the guys uh, first based on score and second based on buck off time. And we specifically need that buck off time because th- we need we need this to be able to break ties. So the team with the rider that has the highest score is going to earn eight points and seven, six, four, three, you know, all the way down to the guy who bucked off the fastest is going to get one. So those bonus points in the event format are going to break the ties. So if there are two teams that are three and O and their riders, you know, both their riders buck off and they finish seventh and eighth in the, in what I'm calling this bonus round, then it'll, they'll just break the tie amongst themselves. So there's no movement, you know, one of the three and O teams, even though they finished last in the bonus round, doesn't mean that they fall down in the rankings. They're just breaking the tie with any other three and O team. And then the same thing will be true, you know, with the other placements. I was going to say, if wouldn't it wouldn't it be the best score of that one is the winner take all for the weekend? Like they're the event champion, or is there not really an event champion? Like is there no real it's teams, bro? But you still well, have, there no, there is no, no, there is an event champion. Let's say that there's two teams that are three and zero. Oh, yeah, right? then this bonus the bonus round is the champion. The bonus round is going to break the tie, and yeah, whichever okay. team came out on top in the bonus round would would be the event winner. Event winner, yeah. Because you still want to yep. have an event winner as a team, and so you can show off five guys that that won it. I guess that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So okay. so we'll definitely have that. Then the other thing that will happen is we're going to be tracking um, the key statistic, maybe not the key statistic, but the key metric is going to be the win loss record that t- that the teams have based on their games throughout the season, um, and they're going to play twenty eight games. It just so happens the math works out, and they all play each other seven times. Is that the right math? I think so. Anyway, um, so. Uh, at, then at the end of the regular season, there could also be ties in the in the win loss record. So we're going to be tracking those bonus points throughout all ten regular season events. And if we need it, it will once again function as a tie break um, for the regular season standings. And that's material again because there's a big bucket of money that's going to pay out according to the final regular season standings. I want to. You mentioned the draft, which I think is a really cool from a fan perspective. We talked a lot from the rider side of things. This definitely brings a new thing to the fans. Um, you see with like NHL, NFL, NBA, they really hype up their draft. A lot of analysis going in beforehand. Is that something to a, from a fan perspective that you guys are going to take an approach is? Absolutely. And it's going to start soon. We're actually having a combine, the, the first nice. ever PBR teams combine in, Love it. Two, in two weeks uh, in Pueblo. Guys are going to go through um, a variety of sort of training and analysis things. Like we're not, we're not interested in their 40 time or how high that they can jump, but the coaches are interested in um, flexibility in core strength and hand-eye coordination and sort of, you know, speed response. Um, we have light boards and things like that at the PBR cool. sport performance center. So 
we are going to be doing measurements with the guys that have direct bearing um, or, or general bearing to bull riding. And then the guys are going to go um, who are participating are going to go beyond some bulls too. Uh, cool. So that combine is going to happen in the weekend between um, between Kansas city and Albuquerque on the unleash the beast schedule. Uh, I, we're expecting right around 75 um, riders to come and participate. All eight teams coaches are going to be there. Some of their ancillary front office staff are going to be coming in as well. So I'm excited about that. Um, and then yes, the draft will be on May 23rd. I mean, uh, uh, three, two thirds of the teams already have draft boards put together that they're already, you know, moving around, which will mm-hmm. obviously change between now and May 23rd, but moving them around that combine will also give the athletes an opportunity to, to, to interview with the coaches, you know, That's um, cool. I think, I think a lot of the coaches are looking for riders who, who have coachability, you know, mm-hmm. um, who will respond to the training that they'll have the op- opportunity to receive. So, um, so I'm excited. The draft on May 23rd is going to be, um, five rounds. Um, so each, so 40 guys will get drafted. Um, the, the guys, uh, let me take a quick step back. Um, the, the riders all, uh, will have an opportunity to review and sign what we call a draft declaration document, which has the, you know, the basics of how, um, the guaranteed comp is going to work for them and the show of appearance money and the prize pool commitment the league is making, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they have until May 6th to sign that agreement, uh, which will be their former de- formal declaration of, uh, participating in the draft. And then a couple of weeks later, the draft will happen on May 23rd. Um, so they'll draft five, uh, five rounds. And then the following week, there'll be what we'll call a supplemental draft where the teams will draft uh, uh, rounds six and seven. Uh, one of the unique things about this, you guys, I think, are close enough to PBR to know that, um, that traditionally, if you're a PBR card holder and you start entering PBR events and you get yourself into the top 35 rankings in the world, it's compulsory that if you're healthy, that you participate in all unleash the beast events. It's, you know, a big part of that is to sort of ensure the ecosystem that fans are actually witnessing the top bull riders in the world. Um, so PBR teams is going to be a little bit different. Riders will have an opportunity to declare for the eligibility for the complete season or sort of availability for the complete season, or they'll have the ability to declare for only part of the season there is a minimum you have to you have to be able to declare for six regular season events plus the championship six plus one we call it so you got to be there for seven of the 11 total events but what we're trying to do here by design is create some flexibility for example a, a rodeo athlete who let's say by may 6th knows that their odds of making the nfr are extremely strong they know their remaining rodeo schedule you know until october 1st or whatever the prca cutoff date is and they can look at their key rodeo schedule where they feel like they need to be overlaying on top of the PBR team schedule and potentially participate in both. Um, and there are already a number of leading bull riders who will remain nameless, but you probably have their phone numbers um, who I would ca- characterize as rodeo regulars who've already said, I want to be part of PBR teams. And this, this approach will give them the flexibility to do that. Because, because um, there will be some events over top of the NFR, if your schedule is November to, uh, well, that's sorry, that's the, that's, that's, that's unleash the beast. Yeah. That's, that's the unleash the beast. beast. Yeah, but that's but right. Yeah, I, uh, I get what you're saying. It's nice to be able to have that flexibility and and be able to get yeah. have guys. And I'm not putting words in your mouth, but have guys like Sage and Stetson and some of these top guys make the make an appearance, which would be which would be great for both. Honestly, what yeah, you- be great for them for the earning opportunity. I mean, you know what they could earn in one weekend of a team's event is more than they they'd they could win at a lot of a lot 100%. of rodeos during the same time frame so 100%. it's a it's an earning opportunity for them too sorry Wacey, go ahead you gotta go uh yeah one more thing is in, again from a fan perspective like this is something i've always wondered too does the team's format make it easier to follow as a casual fan i know if you're not really immersed in the way things are structured with the rodeo and bull riding it's hard to follow the points and who, where people finish and but from a team's format it'd be easy for a person who kind of just picks watching at a bar it's like okay this team's winning absolutely I, I, absolutely. And the resolution happens right before your eyes. You're not trying to keep mental track of 40 bull ride scores um, because you're watching a five versus five mm-hmm. matchup. I mean, we're going to go back and forth, you know, Ted, Ted's guy, Wacy's guy, Ted's guy, Wacy's guy, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Boom. We're done after 10 bull rides. And we know who, we know who won the game. Um, so that's absolutely 
uh, embedded in the design of, of how it works. I also think that it's going to lend itself more to, to gambling. You know, you get, we're all aware of sports fans that oh, gambling, man. I think is now rolled out. I don't remember the state count, but it's like half the country or, or, Canada, or maybe more. That's good now too. Yep. And so I think that'll factor in too. Um, and by design, we want to bring in, you know, more casual sports fans who say, wow, this is, this is exciting. And it's just, it's easier for me to follow these five guys wearing the same Jersey, you know, than a bunch of individual bull riders. I just saw that with the global cup in Canada. Like I had friends who aren't rodeo people, but they was on TSN live and they're watching team Canada mm-hmm. compete against all these different countries and people were getting hyped up because they knew how, how to follow it, which I think is such a cool thing. I think yep. that, I think that PBR teams and, and correct me if I'm wrong too, Chad, but PBR teams could be your, could be one of your greatest achievements is in the, in marketing and changing an entire sport. Like, have you, you, have you had an opportunity like this before to, put your mark on an entire sport because i think this teams of being the leader of the teams you've been working on this for a long time and this is you've gone through all these scenarios and built this and and tell me like and tell me if i'm wrong but but what like no no you're you're, you're absolutely right and i you know i i don't want to suggest for a moment that i'm doing this alone <laughs> there's a small no, no, army there's yeah. a small <laughs> army of people but you are who, the leader in, uh, in this segment but, of, of but this. yes that is that is fair uh and yeah i i agree with you ted i think when when this is as successful as we envision that it can be, particularly when, you know, I try to look in the crystal ball at five years from now or 10 years from now. I mean, this thing, it's just, it's massive. The potential for media coverage, for sponsorship, for hometown fandom, you know, and think beyond, we're consciously starting with eight teams. We think that it's going to be manageable. It's going to be challenging, but it's going to be manageable. And we think eight is the right number to set ourselves up for success. You know, but but three, four, five years from now, are we going to have twelve teams? And six, seven, eight years from now, are we going to have sixteen teams? Heck yes, you know. And at that point, at, you know, I mean, at, at that point, it's huge. It could fill up half the calendar. It'll be a lot bigger than eleven weekends. Well, um, it, so does it become the entire sport at some point in the PBR, or will there always I, be that individual world champion race? I don't know. I I, I don't know. I, I for me, I'm I'm a little hard pressed to think that. Um, that we'd walk away from, you know, from the history of a world champion. And I, I, I think that's important. Um, not just looking backward, but looking forward. I think that's important because it's the, it's the crowning of, of what we believe is the best bull rider in the world who's proved it because they've, they've gotten on the rankest bulls in the world and, and for a, an entire season and have had that body of work, you know, we could debate till the cows come home the PRCA gold buckle winner bull rider, you know, versus the, the PBR one. And I think that can be a fun and, and healthy debate, but, but both sports have it set up to say, you know, this is the number one bull rider in the world. Um, teams won't really, you know, the difference there is that we'll have the best team of bull riders in the world. No doubt. I think that'll be pretty inarguable and we can put together our fantasy teams, you know, uh, of what, of what all that would look like and have those conversations like occur in every other sport. Um, but I, you know, for, so I don't know, it's a long winded answer, Ted, but, um, I, I, I think there's plenty of runway into the future for them to coexist. The, the, what I'm, what I'm hearing you say and what I'm, <coughs> what, what I, what I think about here is the NHL started with six teams. I don't know how many the NBA and MLB started with. I'm not enough of a fan of them to know, but they started with that and, Sidney Crosby is a standout in the NHL and so is Connor McDavid. And, and, you know, we can still have standouts inside PBR teams and there could be a, there could be a race for the scoring title of the guy who ha- makes or the MVP, most MVP, ride. MVP of the league. MVP, or, you can yeah, have awards right. like those guys could still in, exist in the league. In, in what I'm thinking based on what, what I, what I'm hearing. So I think it could work. You could almost have a, uh, you, you'd have a scoring race inside leagues and that would be your yep. be your world champion, but it would be your MVP like Racy's saying. So I think it could almost, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to be in five years, but it could be. And going back to the marketing side of things, we're marketing bull riding in a way. And what you're building is, is making it something that's a lot more easy to follow, easy to understand, easier to, it's easier. It's more marketable because Mark yep. marketability, marketability is, for one thing, I feel like it's simplicity. 
It's it's like the PBR logo. It's bull riding. You know, it's bull riding. It's cowboy shit on Wasey's hat. It's 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 easy and it's, and it's simple. So teams, I, I I think it it sounds like it's once it gets going, it's going to be easy to follow. And that and that is a huge part part of the marketing side of it. Yep, I agree. I mean, you know, Wasey brought up a few minutes ago, uh, and it's usually part of my opening comments on why teams, which is easier to follow. Open the proverbial tent to to more and more fans and traditional sports fans who say oh, okay i get this now i can follow this they don't have to be able to break down mm-hmm. you know how this bull earned 42 points versus 44 points and how that contributes to the ride it's like it's a little more of a one up one down you know kind, kind of a situation well did, and i've thought about the t- world title race being who he who rides the most bulls wins because if you go back throughout the years whoever rides the most bulls pretty much wins so you could simplify it down to if the guy stays on the most he wins possibly I don't know yep. how that would actually break down, but if you look at a team's comparable, the reason why the Rangeland Derby, the Calgary St. Pete is so successful and why people like it so much is like Jimmy who works downtown in Calgary can come watch the chuck wagons, bed yeah. tunes with his buddies. There's a winner every time it's a race of four wagons. It's easy to follow where if they come to the rodeo in the afternoon, they don't pay attention to the rodeo one one on the screen. They have no idea what's going on. And I've sat with That's my right. friends who I work with and on buddies I have in town here. It's like, if you're not an, an avid rodeo fan or bull riding fan. You don't know what's going on. Whereas in the team's format, it's easy. Like this team wins, this team loses. It's, it's a clear cut winner every time. Wait, yeah. With, ch- with Chuck wagons, team? it's a race. Who, yeah, what, yeah. Which nose crosses the finish line first? I don't have to know about <laughs> exactly. technique to know that chuck wagon just crossed first. Um, and in the team format, it might simplify it to say, you know, the team, I think this is part of the point you were making, Ted, you were talking about world, the world championship, but it's like the in the team format, the team that posts the most qualified rides is going to win 70 or 80 percent of the games and they're almost certainly going to win the regular season and the you know in the in the championship season it's going to be the math is is i think a lot of weekends is going to be a little less about trying to put up 92 point rides and a little more about you got to cover the bull because four bulls is going to beat three bulls every single time you know what i mean three 99 point bull rides can't beat four qualified rides ever Mm -hmm. Which is where your coaching aspect comes in. You got, that's where you that's hope right. your coach can match your riders up, which is, it adds a whole new element to the sport, which I think is so cool, and which is why team sports are so successful, like the hockey's, baseball's, yep. footballs of the world, and, and basketball and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, it, I'm it opens it up it. for the riders too. You know, it's like they are guys who go left really well, and if you if you threw away all their right handed outs and you just went just look at their left outs suddenly you'll see that their riding percentage is, you know, 45% or 55% instead. And the coaches and the, their staffs are doing this math right now. So there, is a, is a good there could be a reason to draft the guy that consistently goes left really well, because you can decide to only put him on left-hand bulls. Like mm-hmm. the odds of you getting a bullpen that only go right are pretty low. But if it happens to you as a coach, no big deal. I got alternates. Leave my lefty you know, and it's the same thing we do with pitchers. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Are we are we looking for short downs or or is this a long down play? Which running back do I put in? Do I have four wide receivers on the field right now and nobody in the backfield? Or do I have, you know, two like so? And that's coaching. It's it's game. It's it's game, uh, game planning and play calling and yeah. game management. Yeah. So I think it's just so I mean, you can tell the excitement in my voice. I'm so excited that I'm these up. kinds of like classic sports things are now going to be able to apply to bull riding um, I love it. for 11 whole weekends. If you need some analysts, we know a couple guys <laughs> who know for, a couple for, things about bull for riding. the Twitch stream. And who've been <laughs> on, on stuff before. <laughs> uh, Wait, so you got to, ro- you got to run or where you at? I, I got to, I should get rolling here. Yeah. Um, go. I got Ramir. a couple more. If uh, yeah, if we're still good. Sounds good. Okay. Take care guys. Have fun. Thanks again, Chad. So one thing, one thing I had, um, there's a bunch of stuff we can get to, but I really wanted to ask about the logos. I was, it's one thing we talked about on the show previously, but I was, I was surprised that the logos weren't all consistent across the entire league where the NBA, NFL, NHL, it's all really consistent. It looks like they're all almost from the same designer where these ones Mm -hmm. were, there was a lot of uh, variation. So I, I was hoping you'd speak to that a little bit as to how Yeah, we really, yeah, we really wanted to give the teams the, you know, the flexibility to design the way that they very much wanted to design. Um, and so um, it, it, and we had discussion around this, you know, the benefit of consistency. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, part of what, 
part of what we want the magic to be here is that each hometown is going to have its own unique identity, its own unique brand storytelling. And the logo, I think, is a really key part of that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we've got the Missouri Thunder um, with a with a nice sort of, you know, bullhead, bull skull in there. We've got the Austin Gamblers, you know, that have a kind of an old school cowboy gambler in there with the dead man's hand uh aces and eights you know in the in the fix we've got uh the arizona ridge riders which which have a logo that that to me looks a little jump man-esque you know a little <laughs> bit a little bit michael jordan jump man-esque and i i know that was a conscious des- design decision uh that they made so the carolina cowboys logo i'll give you a little tease here the the uh, initially when he when we announced the carolina team it was going to be called the chaos. We've since changed that name to the Carolina Cowboys. Uh, and Tuesday, a new logo is going to be unveiled uh, at the at a press event in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, and that one has some some NASCAR and some racing uh, um, cues in it because the team is being managed by a very successful NASCAR group, Richard Childress Racing, and Austin Dillon is the general manager. So. They're just there's a lot of fun to be had, I think, in the in the logos and the marks. And there's a couple there's a look at the the a couple of logos like we were talking about. Austin Gamblers, uh Teton Ridge Range Riders. Yeah, the Ridge Ridge Riders. Ridge Riders. Yep. Carolina Cowboys, which is gonna have a new logo, Kansas City Outlaws. Here's a yep. look at this as well. And then uh Nashville Stampede, blue and yellow. I see Keith Ryan Cartwright already already going hard on that one. Oklahoma Freedom. Yep, love the red, white, and blue there. That Nashville 100%. Stampede logo, the blue and yellow, partly comes from the Tennessee State flag. Um, oh, okay. So that's exciting. Missouri Thunder, their color palette, of course, comes from Bass Pro Shop, which is their primary sponsor. The Johnny Morris, who owns Bass Pro Shop, and Cabela's owns the Missouri Thunder. And we didn't even get into that part of it uh, very much either, but we could have... Uh... Yeah, talked about this incredible assembly of owners. I'll, I'll speak to it for, for a minute. I mean, we're just, we're thrilled... So there are eight teams, six of them, the, the league has sold what we call sanctions. And then two of them are actually league owned uh, sanctions that are going to be operated by, uh, by third party at arm's length from the league. So um, among our six owners, we've got uh, some very successful business people and also notably very successful sports operators. So let me riff through that. Um, Mr. John Fisher owns the Texas Rattlers. John uh, owns Ariat, a uh, well-known Western and you know English brand. Um, he also owns the Oakland A's and uh, controlling interest in the San Jose Earthquakes, both successful franchises in the Bay Area, um, really well-respected operator. Um, the, the Arizona Ridge Riders are owned by Thomas Toll. Uh, Thomas founded Legendary Entertainment, and, among other businesses, very successful businessman, well-respected. He's also a minority stakeholder in the NFL Pittsburgh Steelers. So now we've got MLB, we've got MLS, and we've got the Pittsburgh Steelers. And he's on um, the Forbes list too. The only one, the only one, I, one of the only folks I saw on the Forbes list. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, Egon Durbin owns the Austin Gambler, uh, Gamblers. E- Egon has a substantial stake in Manchester City, which is one of the two most oh, wow. valuable you know, European soccer, aka football, um, franchises in the world. He also owns uh, a stake in NYCFC, which is one of the two MLS teams in New York City. He also owns 10% of Madison Square Garden Entertainment, which owns the New York Knicks and the New York Rangers. So we have wow. the wow. NHL and the NBA re- you know, represented as well. Uh, so it's, it's really exciting uh, to think about. And then I mentioned a, a few minutes ago that Richard Childress Racing is operating, uh, will operate the Carolina Cowboys team. So that gives us, that gives us NASCAR. Uh, and then there's some baseball wow. experience in the operating group, which is called prodigal sport. That's operating the Oklahoma freedom team. So, uh, you know, we, we love that. I'm very excited that, um, that these savvy sports operators are going to bring the experience that they have to the team's league. Of course, we've had a, a big number of owner meetings uh, and we, uh, and, and they're just, they keep informing the business plan for us too. Um, the other team I should mention is Morris media owns the Nashville stampede. They own Western horse and magazine. They own road to the horse. They own NBHA, uh, national barrel horse association. So there's also a lot of great, 
Western in the mix. The, the Ridge, Teton Ridge, who owns the Ridge Riders, that's Thomas Toll. They also own uh, now um, Better American. Barrel Racing and the American. And so, you know, the some premier Western and equine sports properties are also uh, in the mix. So it's exciting for us. So I had read at one point that the team uh, buy-in or team purchase was two, it was either two or $3 million per team. Uh, and then I read another story somewhere where that somebody thought that might've been undervalued. What are your, what are your thoughts that way? Yeah. So the reported, I'll say it this way. Um, the reported sanctioning sale price was $3 million. Uh, that's referenced in a wall street journal article from, uh, yeah. from early January. So you can look that up. Uh, and, and then, yeah, I think there's some folks out from the outside, um, looking in who have sort of asked that question, wow, were, were, you know, were these underpriced from the get-go? I mean, our, our strategy around this was um, not about going to market to see, uh, you know, how we could yield the, the largest sanctioning fee possible. Um, what we wanted was to assemble a really class uh, collection of owners who could help us guide the league, you know, as much as we're guiding it from the league office. And I, I, we've achieved that. So I, we will, when this is successful, we will have expansion in the future. I won't put a, a timetable on that because we candidly don't know exactly what it is. Um, but, but when expansion occurs, I absolutely anticipate that uh, the sanctioning fees will go for a much higher dollar amount than the $3 million. I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up here quick. The, the, the team owners uh, with the, I, I, with the man who owns part of the MSG entertainment group, is this somebody who was connected with the PBR through the event there or where did some of the, where did the different owners, how did they end up being owners? That that's what, yeah. that's what's, what's I'm wondering about now. <laughs> well, John Fisher has been a longtime partner of PBR through area, right? Okay. Um, we've yes, had a very successful sponsorship one. and partnership with them. So Plus that answers that shops, one. Same thing. <clears throat> that's Prodigal right. Agency. Um, yeah. That's Prodigal who's managing the Oklahoma freedom team. They represent some bull riders. So they've got a lot of knowledge in the area. Um, there have also been a co-promotion partner for the Oklahoma city unleash the beast event and also the Tulsa unleash the beast event. So there's some experience there. Um, Richard Childress, I would say is, is kind of been a friend of the PBR for, for a good number of years. Um, he's a fan of the sport. Uh, he knows, uh, some of us on the executive team and then his grandson, Austin Dillon, who's a Daytona 500 winning, you know, current NASCAR driver. He's friends with several um, bull riders. He's a huge fan of the sport and he wanted to be the general manager, you know, so he's got equity in the team or will have equity in the team as well. Um, and it'll be the GM of the team. So that's, that's exciting for us. Um, Teton Ridge, they've got employees and advisors who know PBR really well. Uh, and I've seen a, a couple of former employees. That's right. Uh, former PBR employees amongst the executive ranks. Um, uh, the Kansas city outlaws, uh, team is uh, is owned by the uh, two guys who were involved in the fanning of founding of Bad Boy Mowers, um, and Bad Boy Mowers is a longtime PBR partner. So they've seen the power of the PBR for their own company and their own brand, uh, and were one of the one of the first uh, owners to come in as well. They have various other businesses now also, um, and so um, yeah, I would say we just we, the league. Uh, had relationships in one way or another with, with all of these owners with Morris media, we represented their media rights around road to the horse, you know? So there was, there was connective tissue there. Okay. Um, I figured it would have to be something like that. It wouldn't have anybody totally coming out of the blue, but uh, I was curious on the connections. So the, the one question that Wacy asks every single time is, is to wrap up the show is, is what, what our guests definition of cowboy shit is. And we had a conversation off the uh, off camera before we got going, and I think that might tie into it a little bit. So I don't need it. We don't need to ask you exactly what your definition is, but I want I want you to speak to uh, speak to the uh, World Bicycle Relief crew that you've uh, done a lot of work with, and and tie it in how you how you wish. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, cowboy shit is all about cowboy values. Um, which are about integrity and honor at, at trust. It's, it's about self-sufficiency, but at the same time being quick to help a neighbor, you know, who needs, who needs help. Um, it's one of the things that really thrills me about the opportunity I've had over the past six years to work in the Western sports industry um, and work for PBR. So one of the ways I've applied uh, cowboy shit values uh, in my own life is that last year I took on a huge challenge. I'm a lifelong cyclist. 
and I took on a huge challenge last year um, that's continuing into this year, actually, uh, to raise money for a really impactful global charity called World Bicycle Relief. Um, they put bikes in per develop particularly developing countries where um, transportation challenges are, uh, are, are a major barrier to fundamentals like healthcare and being able to travel to work. And so these are very reliable um, bicycles. It's a sustainable program where they train mechanics in the community um, in order to, uh, to keep the bikes running. And it can have a really transformational impact uh, on the lives of, of families in these communities. And so to raise money for work, World Bicycle Relief, I took on a huge challenge of 600 mile off-road bicycle races. Um, five of them were, are called uh, gravel races. It's kind of a new way of principally racing on gravel roads. Uh, and those all took me between seven and seven and a half hours to complete. Um, and then the, the granddaddy of races that I did was actually a mountain bike race in Colorado in Leadville, which holds the distinction of the highest incorporated town in the United States at 10,200 feet. The race started downtown at 10.2, uh, went up and over uh, several mountain passes, including one that was 14,000 and change and, and feet in elevation, uh, 105 mile race, it took me 11 and a half hours to compete. And by finishing under the 12 hour deadline, I earned myself uh, my very own Leadville 100 uh, cowboy belt buckle. It's very cowboy up in Leadville. Uh, and so I proudly wear this to PBR events because while I am too chicken shit to get on the back of a proper bucking bull, um, I do have cowboy grit and have earned myself a, a belt buckle that I'm proud of. So thanks I for, like thanks for letting me talk about it a little bit. That's cowboy shit to me. I like it. I, okay. Uh, and I had one more thing that I for, forgot about, but, uh, where are we at right now with ride pass Pluto TV? And we watched the global cup on Facebook this last week, but how, how, how do we get it up? Get watching PBR again up here in Canada. Yeah. Pluto TV is working on their global rollout strategy. Um, yeah. And in fact, Pluto TV is available in Canada, but the tricky thing is it's an important enough market to them that they have their own dedicated channel lineup in Canada that doesn't at this time include RidePass. Um, so we've, we've, had, we've encouraged our fans in Canada and in Australia where the same situation applies to really agitate locally and send emails to Pluto saying, hey, we want this channel. They have the rights to the channel. Uh, they just haven't, haven't launched it yet there. So um, for countries that have their own dedicated Pluto TV channel lineup, unfortunately, RidePass isn't available except for the United States. For countries that don't have their own dedicated, they are able to actually get it by going to Pluto.tv. Um, okay. So uh, I wonder if you could use Work a, on that. <laughs> use a VPN uh, little masking and get, oh, yeah, get yourself into true. Pluto.tv. I, never thought, I think I never that would be about that part. a strategy that wouldn't, uh, <laughs> wouldn't really violate the terms of our, uh, of our agreement with Pluto. Um, That's good, good so yeah. Know. So making, making the PBR available events available on Facebook live is something that we're doing in those countries that have been impacted by that. And we're doing that with the blessing of Pluto. They've been, they've been great partners to us and they're working on the, the rollout in other countries, but they're, they're, they're bandwidth issues um at, at play there okay well i i won't so, uh i won't keep you any longer on this chad this has been an outstanding visit i appreciate the time it's good to catch up it's been a long time so you too we, yeah it has been yeah we uh we appreciate it very much again chad blankenship thank from the professional bullwatters he's leading the team initiative and uh, it all starts july 25th and 26th neutral ground cheyenne wyoming cheyenne frontier days it's a monday tuesday night gonna be a heck of a show gonna wrap up november 4th to 6th in uh, the former home of the PBR World Finals, Las Vegas. That's right. Nevada at the T-Mobile Arena. But uh, check it out, PBR.com, for everything you need to know about PBR teams. Thanks again, Chad. Thanks, Ted. Bye. So your boots, they're road and dusty and lying down on the floor. And a candlelight, it's burning outside your door. And you're gonna keep staying single, man You never stay too long And that highway's gonna kill you Before too long Cause you're always out running Trying to get by You never even notice how hard that she
thanks again to Chad Blankenship for joining the show this week. Appreciate the comments on PBR teams and looking forward to seeing that get going way. See, uh, there's a few things I remember thinking about this after we recorded that show. And, uh, what would I say? I'm, I'm, uh, the Carolina Cowboys have their new logo. We saw that come out since we did the show with Chad. Yeah. Uh, I think they nailed that one. It looks badass on the race car. It's better than the chaos or what it was yeah. before. Yeah. yeah and it ended up being a better rebrand. Like which is also better. surprising that there's that many teams and there's only one set of Cowboys, which is kind of neat too, but it's, it's nice to see some, uh, something different though. Cause it would been an easy to like, it's an easy default for like a Western sports thing. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. And, the, and I mean, I think it goes back to, I got to put another point about the global cup where most of the countries have an animal that makes sense for them on their, mm-hmm. on their thing. And we just have like a bull, which is easy for a bull riding company. They just have a bull with a maple leaf, but I think we need to have a polar bear or there needs to be, I think there still needs to be a team Canada a rebuild a moose or like something very Canadian. Cause a bull is not a Canadian animal. So no. PBR rebrand or whoever's listening. If anybody cares, rebrand <laughs> needed for team Canada, but um, I'm looking forward to seeing what it looks like uh, there. You know, there's a lot of people that, that doubt probably are out there doubting it, but mm. there was lots of people that doubted the PBR in the first place. So I'm curious to see what happens. And, uh, and mm. I, uh, for the sake of the sport, I hope it goes very well. And I hope it just does nothing but good for the sport. And I know people are probably going to still be disappointed with some things, but I still think, uh, I still hope you gotta be it, willing to, right to push it though. And Chen, like willing yeah. to change. I think that's really, that's one of the coolest things of it all is yeah. the PBR is once again, finding a way to change it and kind of make it more consumable in a sense for some people and, and yeah. just trying to try something new. I think just that willingness to try, like 100%. it could fall flat on its fate, but it could be could the work. deadliest thing that's happened. So I think it's so, really cool. It's been cool I, to see the communities that some of the towns are, are some of the teams are in, like getting behind it. Like the Kansas City, like they had the Kansas City Chiefs like interacting with them on yeah, social media. Yeah, that's cool. So I think I think if they, if they can kind of even like we have in Calgary, like Calgary Sport and Entertainment, that we have a whole there's like everybody kind of works together. So if you can see some of that, in well, they're all owned by the same company there. too, which is part of the deal in Calgary. Yeah, but 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 you know what I mean. Like if there could be some sort of like like just having them like talk about them on social media just amplifies that exposure for them and stuff so there, 100%. Could, be, there could be like that in the communities i think that's a good start for these teams 100 percent. i'm uh i don't know if i f- can't remember if i asked the question or not so uh, this might be going on the wrong path but i wonder what it'll do to the individual athletes and their brands because we're going to lose some of the they're going to lose some of their brand power by having a team so i'm curious what that does for the individuals but i don't know I think you, I think you'll still have your know. stars be your stars, man. Like you're going to have your guys. It's the same as any sport. Like you still have the Tom Brady's and the, yeah, the Patrick Mahomes still and, do. The, and the, I and agree. the, and the, and the McDavid's and those kind of guys. I think some of it falls on to the individuals to make sure that they keep pumping up their, per, or like take, take, take ownership of their personal brand as yeah. well. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, like you look at McDavid even in a sense, like, well, yeah, does and, all these yeah. Other if you're the to, best, I, 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 I think I get it, but I, I think you're, I think by having the teams, some of the focus is changed to the team branding rather than the individual branding. And I think, you know who I think it might hurt the most is the bulls. I think the bull power might change in the bull, the power of the bulls brand, like the bull, the bull branding might change. They might end up being a, uh, you know, like end up being a third wheel, maybe almost on the branding side of things. Like you're going to have teams be like the top piece of it probably. Right. Are you going to have the stars be the top piece of it? Like what's your brand guidelines look like this now where right now it's bulls and it's cowboys where when we move forward with the teams, it's going to be, it's going to be teams number one, then cowboys. And then bulls are probably going to be a little bit relegated. Like they might lose a bit of, I don't want to say, I don't know if I want to say brand power or what it might mm-hmm. be, but are we going to notice whoopah as much when we have a team to worry about and Jose let me to worry about. Is that I think, right? I think you can still tell. I think you still have that storytelling aspect. I see where you're coming from, but I think you still have that aspect in the matchups where you, you can still build that up. But I think maybe it will take away a little bit of it having the, the team focus. But I don't know if that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, I, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing either. No. But I mean, but it, but it might be. It might not be good for the bull business because there might be less value on a bull name if there's more value on a team. I, I don't know. I'm curious. I wonder if the team owners will end up owning bulls too, or if they already do, Could be, or yeah. if they can. 
I'm not sure. Anyways, yeah. a few more qu- things to think about, but uh, looking forward to seeing it. Uh, excited to see the first one. Hopefully we can make it down to Cheyenne and, uh, and see that first one. If not, we'll be tuned in, but uh, let's get back to Florida, Wacy. So after, uh, yeah, after, after Disney world, we jumped in the car, went South, ended up in uh, Everglades city. So we drove from Orlando cause we could get a direct flight with WestJet. went to Orlando, did the Disney thing. Uh, then drove down to Everglades City, like I said, checked into our room in the afternoon, got a few beers. It was a cool drive through like central Florida. I got to kind of see yeah. what the land, a lot of agriculture and Tons. stuff in that area, which is really cool. Yeah. Drove through uh, Panther National Park. Yeah. Kind of cool. So some wild That's ass right. gators. <laughs> yeah. On the side of the road. Literally. Yeah. They weren't on the road, but they made like, they had like a, like a, a little dugout kind of the canal canal. Yeah. The canal. And they had like, what do you call that? Like a guardrail was the fence yeah. to keep them in the to keep them in the their little gator and it was a pretty steep trial. bank along the highway so it'd be hard for them yeah. to get up get it over but over by the highway but literally it would have been like were we like 20 30, feet away from like it? yeah 30 35 feet probably 30 it was yeah, pretty 30 cool feet. so really cool the road saw the gators saw the outback steakhouse saw all the american chain foods you got to yourself some dunkin donuts coffee for man those? dunkin donuts is Awesome. I'm a big fan. Clay and, <laughs> Clay and David got me Dunkin' Donuts on the way to the airport. On the way back. I was yeah. telling them how much I liked it. Yeah, I had it good. twice. He's changed forever. Their iced cool. coffee slaps, man. It's the best I've had. <laughs> That's what, I'll die on that hill. We didn't uh, We didn't try out the munchkins, which are also basically Timbits. But, but, Their donuts uh, are kick-ass, too. Time. The donuts yeah. were good. I will, I will say that it was fresher than a lot of Tim Hortons donuts I've had. So mm-hmm. that was Kudos. great. Uh, Get to Everglades City though. We met up with Clay and David from uh, from the Wrangler Network. Met our one of our guides was uh, was Amos Tiger from the Seminole Tribe, Seminole Hard Rock Crew. Uh, had a good visit on Sunday night. Kind of got to got to lay of the land. And like five thirty in the morning, we were up ready to go fishing. The next mm-hmm. day, get on the water. We make a little bet. Way see you. Uh, who's gonna catch the most fish? Well, I had never we tried. We, before, so we tried Gator Gator Nuggets too the night before. That well, that's right. That's right. We did that on yeah. uh, at the <laughs> at the restaurant the Island cafe in Everglades yeah. city, which is for those who don't know. So Orlando is kind of central Florida, I want to say. Uh, and then four hours South Everglades city is right on the water, essentially. Uh, so tiny little west. town. It's not really a city either. Yeah. It's South it's South and East of Naples and Fort Myers. And it's like kind of like Southwest it's, it'd be almost straight North of Key West as well. If you're going that way. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, Everglades City got hooked up with uh, with our guide uh, Mike Merritt in the morning. Tried the Gator Nuggets; they were good. Frog legs did not love them. Uh, Wacy dropped his, so you got a little bit of a bite. But I just couldn't get past it. Like it was pretty, like it was probably pretty good, but I just couldn't get yeah, it around that it was tastes, a frog leg. Yeah, it tastes like chicken. Yeah, frogs are weird. It's you also said cold. that Gator tastes like chicken, so it does. Yeah, <laughs> like rubbery chicken. Yeah. Uh, anyways, tried some new food. Got on the water. Uh, we made a little bet. I had never caught a fish before. Don't take, don't tell, don't, don't tell the, don't tell the score. Don't tell the score. Okay. Wait till they, wait till they put it out. Okay. So the video will be coming out. So, so, uh, check it out. But, uh, so we had a, we had a crew, we, so we had a crew with us. We had a guy, our, our video. Atalano Nunez. Atalano. And Atalano, yeah, he, he's worked, worked on, on like Jackass and Wild Boys, like some cool, yeah. he was awesome. He was That's great really to work cool with. Stuff. We have a full, like, there'll be a full like video coming out with Ranger Network kind of summarizing the day but the, yeah, the first day was fishing it was so cool man i got right, to see some real time cool stuff so we some wildlife the dolphins were swam along with us we mm-hmm. caught a bunch of fish we caught quite a few fish though between the three of us if we would have let yeah. storm fish longer she probably would have beat our asses but yeah we had a uh pretty large time a cool, a cool part of it too so much cool fun. part of it too is our like mike Merritt, our guy he was very knowledgeable of the area he grew up there graduated yeah. high school in everglades city he would like yeah, there was a couple like homestead areas in like kind of where we were fishing. It was really neat to have like that aspect. I would have someone who was oh, yeah. like kind of knew the land and kind of would tell the stories about it all, which was great. End, of, end was, of the road kind of place. Hey, like there's there's not much past it, right? You're going there and there's I think it's the, the ten thousand island area. There's, there's a few yeah. islands and there's some stuff further south, but literally like he said when the hurricanes come through, he packs his boat, like gets his boat out of the water and he heads inland. Like he's gone. He's, he's not gone, hanging yeah. around that little spot when the storms come through. So it oh, was, wild. Uh, it's a pretty wild little spot, pretty neat to be off the path and pretty nice little restaurants. There's some storm was saying there's some pretty fancy places there that some people, people own like the, the coach of the Washington Redskins has a place there. The people that own the U line have a place there. So it's kind of a wow. neat, neat deal, but uh, yeah. yeah, it was, it was really cool. I was Such talking with place. 
yeah, I was talking with some friends and stuff once after we got home and my parents and stuff. And I was, I was feeling very fortunate to be able to go on that trip because that had not for that, like there's no way that it ever would have been on my list to travel to yeah. or even to think about going. So it was really neat to explore. Like for Florida, if I were just to plan a trip and go, I'd go do a Disney trip or go to the beach somewhere. I wouldn't. Yeah, you wouldn't ever thought to ever, go there and go fishing. Yeah, and then the everybody's go fishing and airboarding and all the stuff we got to do, which was really cool. Got to, like hanging out with Amos was really neat. He's like oh, his amazing. history and what the Seminole people was cool and exploring that part of the world. It was it was super cool. I was on edge the most of the time with the, the whole snake issue, but <laughs> <laughs> it was it was really neat to see. I'm really thankful that we that it worked out and we were able to when we caught to to make it happen, too. man. Caught yeah, caught some cool too. fish. Uh, yeah, there's snook, there's snookfish, uh, redfish, jackfish. What else? Snapper, some catfish. Snapper, catfish. Yeah, and then I, then I caught a Goliath grouper. That was a pretty neat, neat rig too. We had to throw them back. They can get up to like 600 pounds. It was, yeah. it was so neat though. So cool. Mike did an amazing job guiding us around and had a fun day the next day on the, on the, uh, on the airboat, like you said. Then, yeah. uh, then quick sleep and you were back home. And then Storm and I went down to Key West amazing place love to go back again someday then we went, took some time in miami beach as well then flew out of fort lauderdale on uh so out of those two what were your favorites oh for sure key west it was it was unreal the pace mm-hmm. of that place was so nice so chill like such a nice vibe we had a place uh, our hotel had its own private beach it was one of the only sand beaches in in key west so we hung out there read read a bit of a book had a really nice couple of meals like great food great you know couple of great drinks and nice way to cap the trip off oh it was a really nice way to just kind of take it easy get some sun just have a nice time the moment my alarm went off at 6 30 a.m on thursday morning i was kicking myself for not just taking the extra couple days (laughs) hanging out down there when what rattled me i think for the most was finding out that the jays were starting spring training and we were like we were an hour away from dunedin we just missed it far yeah florida's so so yeah and literally like the spring training started what on the 17th and yeah, the first left, game was on the Friday. The, oh, the 18th. So you left on the 16th. No, it did start on the 17th. You might have been right. I think either yeah, I think, either way, it was two days difference. If I had extended my trip, it. I could just yeah. flew on Sunday and caught a couple of Jays games. Yeah, like that would have been but, so neat. And oh, I like I don't see myself nice. going back over that way to go to spring training. I'd rather just go to a game in like Toronto. Toronto. It's so it's such a far flight. Like we were thinking about on the way back, like for six and a half hours, five and a half hours, might as well almost go to Europe for that far of a flight, right? If you're gonna go that far, you might as well go somewhere. Real it's fun. a big it's a big rip yeah Ooh, for sure yeah she's a long if, that, if that becomes an annual trip though with that crew i definitely will be taking time to go see the spring yeah training. speed spring training that'll be we'll go and we never got to tampa so like tampa will be the the trip next time and i want to go golf in florida so we i shouldn't say i never go back we'll we'll probably go in and it's, out of it's cool it's cool to time. see it's it's be some more disney world it's higher on my list to go back to you now that i've been there because i had no idea yeah, true. what it was all about right it was it was one of those things where I just never, you never think of Florida as a, as a place a person wants to go like top yeah. of the list. Right. So not being from the West for me, for me anyways, I'm sure there's people out there. I get it. I get, get it. horned up for old Florida. Eh? <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> anyways, thanks again to our friends at Wrangler, David Sharp, Clay Handback, uh, Amos Tiger, unreal time down there in Florida. We had a wonderful Atalano. trip. Atalano Nunez, uh, storm. Thanks for coming with us as well. Uh, it was just a ton of fun. So stay tuned. The video will be coming at you. We'll throw a few uh, clips out on social as well. But thanks again to those guys for making it happen. Thanks, Wasty, for making it happen. Thanks for taking the time off work and, and going and doing happy it. Happy to. And, happy to. And, I got uh, a lightsaber out of the deal, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Life's complete. But, uh, oh, man, I had one other fun story. So today uh, I met a friend who I hadn't seen in like 22 years. So we went to school together from probably like, like preschool until grade five. And then he moved away. And... I don't know if we, we hadn't even really kept in contact, but somehow uh, one of us found somebody on social. Like I think, I think Luke f- found me on social somewhere. His name's Luke Larock Walker and he uh, lives in Cochrane now. He's actually a dent- denturist. Like he makes dentures. Yeah. That's Cochrane. a good, that's a good, that's a good profession to be in. Yeah. He told me all about it. Today. It was really yeah. wild, but we met up. We like, he found me on social. We decided we we're going to meet up. So we met up in at Brewster's over in uh, Crowfoot and had a couple beers caught up, like had a really good bullshit um it was pretty neat to like meet like see somebody that i hadn't seen in forever since i was a kid mm-hmm. right so we had a really good k- catch up uh he's got a couple kids it's kind of neat that way and we we talked some stories had a couple beers uh watched some of the <laughs> some of the blue jays game but then afterwards uh i went uh over to lamley's i hadn't been by the lamley store in a, in a little while so i went over to the store and uh cruised in there met uh, uh one of the 
uh, folks working there. His name's Wade. Had a little BS with him. Checked in on the Montana stuff. Checked in on our new cowboy shit buckles are in stock now in stock at Lamley's for those uh, those looking nice. And uh, what do we do? So yeah, so I went in there. And then there's a couple guys, a guy in a PBR hoodie, and then another guy in a cowboy hat. They're both wearing felt hats. The the one guy even had his bull riding spurs on still actually, but uh, <laughs> but uh, they were, had a like a flat straw hat there, like they wanted to get it shaped. And I was like, oh, you get that at Irvine's. And, uh, and they're like, oh yeah, we got it there. Uh, we just need to get it shaped up. I was like, oh, Carly wasn't there or something. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, she wasn't around. So this guy's name is Kale McDonald. And the other guy's name is Justice, uh, uh, Grieger, Grieger or Grigor. It's G-R-I-G-O-R, Grieger. But anyways, uh, so I ended up just hanging out with these guys and I shaped this straw hat up for the guy. Cause Wade was like, ah, I don't like, I don't want to sh- shape that one. I, I, I only do palm leaf. So I was like, ah, oh, shoot. Yeah. I'll, I'll shape it for you. I don't, I don't mind. So I just literally had my like <laughs> street clothes on. I, yeah, I didn't, I just had my street clothes on. Like I didn't look Western at all. And we get talking with these guys and they're, they were coming back from Rimby the night before and they were, uh, they had been, uh, they're like learning how to ride bulls. Right. So, cause I actually, they both found me on Instagram after cause we got talking and, uh, and it looks like they're just kind of getting going kind of thing. But uh, we're at Remy the night before and had this hat. So yeah, I shaped this hat up. It's just kind of random, random Sunday afternoon adventures in, in Calgary. But they were, and they never were talking about you're the, gonna run into. Pardon? Yeah. Never, never who, know who, you're going to run into at a land list. Yeah. So yeah, I saw those guys and then shaped the hat up and, and uh, where was I going with this? There's one other piece to it. The, uh, what the hell? There's a part, another part of the story. But I don't know what it was now. I think you need to come up with it because it's. I'm feeling like I'm lacking information on the story. Yeah. Did I? I told you I shaped the guy's hat, and then I sent mm-hmm. sent them on their way. You I don't know what linked else. up on social. Yeah, linked. Up. Oh yeah, no, it was funny. They were we were talking, and I don't think they like. I literally looked like this. Like I was just casual, like hanging out, wearing my you know downtown clothes essentially because I wasn't really doing Western stuff. But I was like, oh shit, I better go by and check check in on the store. And uh, they, I don't think they had a clue who, who I was like, and they probably had no idea that probably don't know what the podcast or like anything like that. So we get talking they're like, yeah, the BRC. And I was like, oh yeah, I actually named that. Like just out of nowhere. I was like, yeah, I actually named the BRC. Like that was my, I came up with that name and they're like, oh really? And they, they, it sounded like they were kind of interested after that. I was like, yeah, actually. So we were having a meeting at one point and the, the former name was going to be elite Canadian bull riders. That was like the, the name that was being thrown around. I was like, I don't think that's a good call. That's going on over something else. And I was like, I've had this name for a while. I've always thought that Bull Riders Canada would be a cool name and something that would could work for what we're doing. Cause we actually, like I was a shareholder for a while in the BRC, one of the founding members. There was a bunch of us. There's probably 12 of us that were part of that deal. But one of the first phone calls, there was like four or five of us on there and I presented that name. So I think those guys realized that I was legit once I said that. It wasn't. And you were the, yeah. you were the sound guy at the inaugural finals too. Yeah, that's right. You were there too, weren't you, Ace? I was the only only Sask boy to make make the cut only Sask that year. Boy. Wow, what a guy! Yeah. That'll go down in the Deadly. history books. But uh, Maze I don't know if I told that story before, but I thought it was kind of kind of funny to the guys realize that realized I was legit. Happened. Oh, tell them the story about the name. I was like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, that story literally happened today. So I couldn't tell them. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Anyways, it was kind of a fun day. So cool to see guys like that. The wanna ride bulls though. So I was I was mm-hmm. happy. I said yeah. Uh, if you guys ever need anything, just give us a shout or, you know, glad to help out. But if whatever you do, go to as many schools as you can. You don't need to get on a ton of bulls, but go to a shitload of schools and, and learn from those guys. Cause that's the, the only and the best way to do it. So mm-hmm. good luck to justice and kale. Hope you guys, uh, kick ass out there. We'll make a bull rider out of you there someday. One of these days, one of these days. All right. One of these damn days. Kale, yeah, let's roll up, wrap this up ways. Got everything's kind of finally warming up around here and we're going to get back on the road doing some shit and. Got some events coming up, so stay Things tuned. Are at, the wheels are in motion. Stay tuned. April 6th will be the next show, number 114. This is number 113. We're signing off. I'm Ted Soden. He's Wacey Anderson. Thanks for following us along. Appreciate you all. Thanks again, Sean Morton, our editor. Storm Defoe on the website and the graphics. Get your cowboy shit at cowboyshit.ca. And should catch up on old episodes over there, too. See you next time.
Hit my tapes and my CDs just don't sell. I bet my caddy wheel.